We're in Isaiah, and we're in Isaiah uh, 11. But let's back up just for a minute and do just a little summary. Because in Isaiah uh, 9, the end of 9 and into the beginning of 10, uh, we learned that there was going to be a coming judgment on the kingdom of Israel uh, because of their wickedness. Not only because of their wickedness, but because of their pride. Not only because of their pride, but because of their refusal to repent. Not only because of their refusal to repent, but because of their social injustice. So there were four main reasons that judgment needed to continue to find its way until it finds repentance. Judgment will always continue on a path until it finds repentance. That's what happens. Now, when it finds repentance, will there be any more judgment? Yes. Well, not at that point, right? Not at that point for that, right? They'll, not at that point. There won't right. be any, because it need, it's like, oh, okay, excellent. I've accomplished what I need to accomplish, and so therefore... That person has returned. That person has repented. That person has come back to me, the Lord says. Okay, and so he, it's his loving judgment that always, always goes after you in a good, good way, right? Until it finds repentance. So it would behoove us to repent when? Now. 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 You repent now. You repent now. You repent now. You turn. You repent now. Because, because then it's like, okay, he draws us in his loving kindness. That's what he says. I draw you in my loving kindness, right? And then what I'm doing is in discipline, in loving kindness, then what happens is you to return to me. You return to me. You return to me. You return to me. You repent. And Israel did not. Assyria did not. Syria did not. Judah did not. And so it needed to continue. It needed to continue over and over and over again. So if you open up to chapter 10, at the end of chapter 10, starting with verse uh, 33, Isaiah is prophesying and saying in verse 33 of chapter 10, See, the Lord, the Lord Almighty, will lop off the boughs with great power. The lofty trees will be felled, the tall ones will be brought low. He will cut down the forest thickets with an axe. Lebanon will fall before the mighty one. Now let's just stop there for a moment, because uh, what's happening is, is that those of high nature will be hewn down. So in other words, it's not just the common folk that are going to you know, receive judgment, it's going to be those also that were in leadership, okay? So the Lord promises that the judgment will extend to even those who are in leadership, those of high stature, okay? Now, a mighty forest seems invincible. It seems invincible. It's huge, it's mighty, it seems as if it will stand forever. But the Lord can cut it down. The Lord can cut it down. And even so, the Lord will cut down the proud. He will cut down the proud and those of high stature, okay, among Judah. And what will be left then in a once mighty forest will be what? Stumps. It'll be just stumps. That's all it'll be. It'll just be stumps because he's going to cut it down. He says, Lebanon will fall by the mighty one. So the forests of Lebanon were known for their huge cedar trees. They're huge cedar trees. And God will judge the proud among Judah and all the nations, quite frankly, for that matter, Israel, Assyria, and Syria. He will judge them all, okay? And, and he will leave uh, not a mighty forest anymore of high stature. What he will leave will be just stumps. It's like the bigger they are, the harder they fall. However, there is always mercy. There is always hope. So let's look at chapter 11, beginning with verse 1, and see what he's going to bring out of the stumps. All right? Let's look at 11 of Isaiah, chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse 1. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. That capital B, branch, who does that mean? Jesus, that's right. The Messiah. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, 
the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. So let's stop there and go through each verse here. Verse 1 talks about the character of the king, the king Messiah that's going to be coming. A stem sprouts forth from the stump of who? Jesse, from the stump, from the from the stem of Jesse. Okay, now we just saw how God had chopped down the mighty trees and left stumps, and now you can just imagine the Lord is looking over all the stumps. Okay, just picture this. He's looking over all the stumps, and what does he do? He causes a branch, a green little branch, a green little shoot to grow out of a dead stump. And it is from the root of the family of Jesse. And Jesse is the father of whom? King who? David. Excellent. King David. Of King David. Okay. So indeed, Jesus did come from the family of Jesse, okay, from the stump of Jesse, the royal authority of the house of David had lain silent, dormant, for over 600 years. So it was dead, it seemed. It seemed as it was dead. But God, right, my two favorite words, right, but God, what does he do? He brings a green shoot out. He brings a stem. He brings a branch. Jesus, King Messiah, he comes forth like a new green branch does, like our spring, right? Coming forth from an apparently dead stump. See, the Lord wanted Judah to realize that even though the Assyrians were going to bring judgment, okay, uh, God could and would still use them. He could and would still use them. Even if they looked like a long, dead stump, he could and would still use them. God can bring forth life. He brings forth life. I remember a friend of mine, she told me, this is probably, I'd say, over 20 years ago now. And she told me when she came to know Jesus as her Savior, she said, you know, Margo, my whole family and extended family, they don't know Jesus. And I said, yet. They don't know Jesus yet. I said, you're now this green branch. You're now this green branch. You've come out of the stump. You've come out. You know, God's the one who brings forth life. I said, you watch God work. You watch God work in and through you. I said, as you share the gospel, as you are, you know, as you make them homesick for what you have. And it's 20, 25 years later, and every single person in her family and extended family has come to know Jesus personally. Isn't that the sweetest? I mean, that's what he does. That's who he is. He brings life. He absolutely brings life. So, when you call Messiah, the Lord is emphasizing the humble nature of the Messiah. He could have said the Messiah that came from King David, because he did in his family, because King David is the son of Jesse, but he did not. He chose to use humble Jesse, saying the Messiah is going to come from the family of Jesse. Now, I looked up Jesse and did a little side study on him. Jesse is the son of Obed, and he's the grandson of Ruth and Boaz from the book of Ruth. He's the grandson of Ruth and Boaz, okay? He lived in Bethlehem in Judah, and he was a farmer. He was a um, breeder, and he was an owner of sheep. <laughs> there are eight sons. And the youngest was David. So in 1 Samuel 16, the prophet Samuel goes because he was told by the Lord to go because they're going to anoint a new king. So the prophet Samuel shows up 
at Jesse's home and says, okay, the Lord says we're going to anoint a new king. So he brings his firstborn son out, who is amazing in stature, really good looking, tall, you know, built like a brick house, and his name is Eliab. And so he's for sure thinking, this is the guy. This is the guy who God is going to anoint. And this is one of the most popular verses in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, because God then said to the prophet Samuel, he said, do not consider his appearance or his height, because man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart, but God looks at the heart. Okay, so he brings out, you know, number one son, nope, brings out number two son, nope, brings out number three son, nope, four, five, six, seven. I thought you had eight sons. Well, I do. Well, where's your youngest son, David? Well, he's tending sheep. That's my man. That's my man. He's tending sheep. That's the guy I want. That's the guy that's going to be anointed king. So we see in verse 1 the character of the king, that he's coming, he, he's going to be this branch that comes out of this dead apparent stump. And then verse 2, we see the amazing spiritual empowerment of the Messiah, the promised one, the Savior, whose name is Jesus. Okay, let's read verse 2 again of chapter 11. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Let's stop there. All right, so we're going to walk through now each of those, and we need to see that this branch comes apparently from this dead stump, and it isn't just barely alive. It's full of life. This branch is full of life. It's full of the Spirit of the Lord, capital S, Spirit of the Lord, okay? So the Messiah has seven. Seven, by the way, is the number of completeness. It's the number of fullness. It's the number of perfection. It's the number of something that is finished. God created the world, everything in what, six days? And on the seventh day, what did he do? He rested. It, it's, the, it's his number. It's his number. It's a number of completeness and fullness, and, and, it, and that it's something is finished. All right, and so the Messiah has seven, the number of fullness and completion, aspects of the Spirit of the Lord here that Isaiah is talking about. So, first of all, he has the Spirit of the Lord. Okay, he has the Holy Spirit. It's not a false spirit. It's not a deceiving spirit. It's not even a spirit, small s, of a man. Does every human being have a spirit? Here's the key. Yeah. Okay, yes, yes, we all have a spirit. Does every human being have the capital S spirit? No, no, no. okay, we'll, we'll get into that in just a moment, okay? But I wanted to share with you that it's not a deceiving spirit, it's not even the spirit of a man, okay? He has the spirit, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of the Lord. And once Jesus rebuked the disciples, actually, in Luke 9, verse 55, which says, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. Jesus was the spirit of the Lord, and he knew it. And he knew it. Okay, I want you to look at Romans. So I want you to turn from Isaiah to Romans 8. One of my favorite, favorite chapters in the whole Bible. Romans 8. And let's start at, um, let's start at verse 9 of Romans 8. <clears throat> He's talking to believers here. And he says, You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. Now, note the caps in when the Spirit comes up. Okay? The Spirit if the Spirit of God lives in you, okay? So we're talking about the Holy Spirit when it's a capital S, right? And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin. Yet your small s spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit 
who lives in you. Are, you. are you noticing the cap S's and the small S's? Okay. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the cap S spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are what? Our children, our sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit, small s, that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself, verse 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Very important. The Spirit, capital S, meaning Holy Spirit, himself testifies with our spirit, small s, spirit, that we are God's children. So the Holy Spirit who lives in you, and how does the Holy Spirit live in you? By accepting Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life to the Father. That's it. He died on the cross for you. He was raised. Do you walk in resurrection power, and you want to live for and with him forever? Okay? You know that he is the only one who had gone before to forgive your past, present, and future sin, and you've now accepted him into your life. And the Holy Spirit comes to live in you. He that is in us is greater than he that's in the world, 1 John 4, 4 said. And we just saw in Romans 8 that the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in us. Now, the Holy Spirit communes with your spirit, okay? Your child of God. 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 He's continually reassuring you, telling you, I'm the seal that seals you, that you are a child of God. The Holy Spirit communes with your spirit and says, you're a child of God. You're a child of God. Over and over and over and over again. So I want you to understand that there's small s spirit, and then there's the Holy Spirit, big s spirit, okay? And so before we came to know Jesus as our Savior, did we have the big s spirit in us? No. But did we have a small s spirit? Yes. Yes. So, you know, we will always have the flesh, sadly to say, until we see Jesus face to face. But then we will have the Holy Spirit who communes with our spirit, you're a child of God. And then we need to yield our spirit to his. Right? We need to go, okay, I'm listening to you. That's why, like Natalie shared, you need to have your non-negotiable face-to-face time with him. Right? So he can continue to talk to you and you, you continue to be, be sanctified, that big word where, where it means, you know, you're becoming more and more like him and less like your putrid selves. Right? It's a good, good thing. So I want you to understand that the Spirit of the Lord, okay, that rested in Jesus. In Jesus. Okay? It tells us right that in Isaiah. Okay? So back to Isaiah 11. Not only is it the spirit of the Lord, that's number one. Number two, it's a spirit of wisdom is upon the Messiah. The w- wisdom. Jesus is perfectly wise in all things. In all things, okay? And he showed it to us during his earthly ministry. When you walk through the Gospels, you can see it all in his earthly ministry. And he shows us now towards us with his ministry in heaven. He's perfectly wise. Perfectly wise in all things. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30, says that Jesus became for us wisdom from God. Jesus became for us wisdom from God. It isn't that Jesus is just the wisest guy who ever lived. It's not that Jesus has wisdom Jesus equals wisdom. Jesus is wisdom, okay? He is wisdom. He's perfectly wise. He perfectly shows us in his teaching, he perfectly shows us in his life, God's wisdom. He shows us how to walk. True wisdom isn't about getting smart. It's not about getting smart. You know how I'm always telling you as we walk through the Word of God, we walk through the Word of God, it's, it's not for knowledge, right? It's, it's what? We're not to become smarter sinners. 
We're supposed to respond. We're supposed to respond and be changed over and over and over again to become more like him. And so he's perfectly wise. It's n true wisdom isn't about getting smarter, okay? God's wisdom is received in and through the person of Jesus Christ. So we see that, number one, he is the spirit of the Lord. The Messiah does, Jesus. Number two, that he uh, has wisdom, the spirit of wisdom. Three, he has the spirit of understanding. The spirit of understanding is upon him. Jesus understands all things. All things. He understands all things. He understands you and me perfectly. Okay, so most people don't. You know that, right? I mean, does your husband understand you perfectly? Okay, well then run to Jesus. Okay, because I promise you, he understands you perfectly. You should have seen your face. So you're all like... <laughs> I don't know if I should say yes or no, right? <laughs> it was great. Jesus understands us perfectly. Perfectly he understands us. And he is perfectly suited to be our sympathetic high priest in heaven. Now that is in Hebrews. We're going to look up this as well. I want you to see this in Hebrews. Just go back a few chapters from, a few books I should say, from Romans. And I want you to go to uh, let's see, Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4. And I want you to start in verses uh, 14. Hebrews 4, 14. You know what, let's back up. Let's back up to 12 because 14 says therefore, and you have to go back to see why it's therefore, right? So let's go to verse 12. For the word of God is living and active. You know, we always talk about that, right? It's living and active. It's not another book. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Do you see that small, small s there? Dividing soul and spirit? Small s, okay. Joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in just some ways. Is that what it says? Nope. What does it say? Every. In every way. In every way. Underline that. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was what? Without sin. Yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Verse 15 again. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy, not getting what we deserve, and find grace, undeserved favor, to help us in our time of need. There's a great next memory verses for you. The spirit of understanding is upon him. He is suited to be our perfect, sympathetic high priest. Because when he walked through this earth, he was all man and all God. And so he was tempted in every way, as all man. Walking through that as all God, that was a piece of cake. Walking through that as all man, he had to learn obedience to the Holy Spirit that lived in him. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like how we need to walk? Absolutely. So you know, he's a great sympathizer with us. He has been tempted in every way, yet was without sin. He shows us how to walk. He shows us how you can walk through this powerfully. Powerfully. In fact, in the Hebrew, 
that, that word um, in the Hebrew, understanding, it has to do with a sharp sense of smell. A sharp sense of smell. And what he's talking about here is, there is a sharpness of judgment, like you're smelling out a hypocrite. There's a sharpness of judgment, like you're smelling out a hypocrite. It's funny, as I was sharing this with my husband, I'm like, you know, my husband has the most amazing sh sharp sense of smell. Can't see worth life, okay, but, but sharp, sharp sense of smell. I mean, to the point where you can't walk even like in Mayfair or Brookfield, like past those boutique kind of stores or something, or even to the point where he's like, um, like, I, I, like he'll walk in the house and go, what do you think that is? I'm like, I don't smell anything. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm like, hello, I, I don't smell anything. He's like, what do you think that is? And he'll like, I, seriously, I should, I should like earn money on him to be like a bloodhound or something. He's amazing. He's got a sharp, sharp sense of smell. And, and what he's talking about here, the Messiah, the spirit of understanding, it is on Jesus. He's, he, it's the understanding where it's the idea of that sharp sense of smell, that he can smell out a hypocrite. Understanding is upon him. Let's go to the uh, fourth one, the spirit of counsel. The spirit of counsel is upon Jesus. Well, we know from Isaiah 9, when we studied about, at Christmas, when we studied the beginning of 9, right, that for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and he'll be called what? Wonderful counselor. Counselor. He's the counselor, okay? He's the spirit of counsel is upon Jesus. He has perfect counsel to give us at all times. Why don't you run to him first? Don't run to your posse. Run to him. Don't run to the phone to call someone. Run in prayer and call him. Because he says, call to me and I will answer you and I will but tell you great and mighty things or show you which you do not know. He's your counsel. That's why the whole word of God, right? Only book as you read it, it reads you. This is it. That's all we need for life and godliness. This is it. The word of God. He's our counsel. He's our counselor. He's first, second, third. He's our counsel, okay? Perfect counsel at all times because he has perfect wisdom and he has perfect understanding that we just walked through, okay? So perfect wisdom and perfect understanding becomes a perfect counselor. So he has perfect counsel. He wants you to run to him. Notice how some people use prayer as like a last-ditch effort, don't they? Oh, I guess I'm going to have to pray. What? <laughs> go first. Go first. Go first. Not, uh, well, or, uh, well, I guess we can just pray. What do you mean just pray? You're before the throne. God who knows the end from the beginning. God who's a God of all miracles. He never changes. He always wants his best for you. What, are you kidding me? You're just going to pray? You're in the throne room. Go for counsel. Stay there. Like Natalie shared, her life is like he's, he's her counselor. She's walking that way. She's talking that way. She goes for counsel. It's not that she's telling him anymore, hey, God, you know, bless my schedule. Right? She's walking. She's talking with him. He's her counselor. The spirit of counsel is on the Messiah. Then number five, the spirit of might. The spirit of might that's innate power, innate power, is upon Jesus. He has the power to do what he desires to do. He has the power to do what he desires to do. Now, I think many of us would help uh, others, but we're powerless. And on the other hand, many have the power to help us, but they could care less. Not Jesus. Not Jesus. Jesus has both the love and the might to help us. He has both the love and the might to help us. The spirit of might rests on Jesus. Number six, the spirit of knowledge. The spirit of knowledge is upon Jesus. Okay, does Jesus know everything? Okay, I didn't hear you. Yes. Okay, does Jesus know everything? Yes. Okay, does Jesus know our hearts. Yes. Yes. Okay, I didn't hear you. Yes. Yes. yes, okay. Okay, so does Jesus know all the facts? Yes. 
Yes, okay, so if Jesus knows everything, he knows our hearts, he knows all the facts, many times what happens then is that we've made decisions that seem like it's strange or wrong to others because they didn't have the knowledge that we have. Because we have the knowledge through Jesus. Okay, like for instance, when I was led to absolutely um, leave the agency, leave the advertising agency, that would not have been anything I would have done with my own knowledge because I was going to take it over. Okay, it, it was a, I was earning great monies and it was a perfect time and, and my partner was going to be retiring. I mean, it, it's, it, and, and so your, your flesh, your logic would say, this is how you're supposed to walk. And then Jesus, the Spirit of the Lord, Spirit of knowledge, he's going, oh, Margo, you need to leave, you need to leave, you need to leave. Okay, which made no sense to anybody else. No sense to anybody else. It's just doing the next right thing because you're just being obedient. You're being obedient. You're just doing the next right thing, the next right thing, the next right thing, the next right thing. Now, it didn't make a lot of sense to anybody else. But I knew that he knew. And he knows the end from the beginning. I'm just going to step out by faith, just like Abraham did. Abraham had everything going for him, and what did he do? He said, um, I left not knowing where I was going. But he knew the one who was taking him. That's the best part. That's the best part. See, Jesus has knowledge that we don't have. So it shouldn't surprise you and me that sometimes his decisions are strange or odd to others. Like when someone goes, you know what? We're packing up and we're leaving for mission. We're, we're leaving for a mission trip. That's it. We're, we're going we're gonna to live in another country. Have hardships. Okay, that's, that's, that's strange or odd to the majority of people. Not to Jesus. Not to him talking. He's got knowledge. He's got knowledge, okay, that we don't have. That we don't have. And then lastly, it's the spirit of the fear of the Lord. The spirit of the fear of the Lord is upon Jesus. Jesus willingly, keyword, willingly kept himself in a place of absolute submission, respect, and honor to his Father. Willingly. Willingly. I'm here to do my Father's will. That's how we're supposed to walk. That's how we're supposed to walk. So we just walked through these seven aspects of the Spirit of God, okay? Now, I, I want you to know these are not the only characteristics of the Holy Spirit, okay? Because we've talked about him before. Like, you know, he's your illuminator. He knows all truth. I mean, and so those are not the only characteristics of the Holy Spirit, but they're grouped together here in Isaiah in, in seven to show you the fullness and the perfection of the Holy Spirit, that's why Isaiah grouped them that way. And so this passage then is behind the term, have you heard the term, the sevenfold Spirit of God? Have you heard that term before? The sevenfold Spirit of God. Okay, that does not mean that there are seven Holy Spirits. Okay, it's a sevenfold Spirit of God. Uh, it, it means that the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, has these characteristics and has them in all fullness and in all completion. I want you to see where that actually falls. It's in Revelation. Turn to Revelation. Uh, chapter 5, it's the last book of the Bible, when John received the revelation from Jesus Christ as he peered into heaven. Revelation 5, and let's see, verse, verse 6. This is John speaking. Verse 6, then I saw a lamb, capital L, who is that? Jesus. Jesus. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne and circled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Okay, that's the sevenfold spirit, okay, of God. That isn't seven Holy Spirits. That's what we just talked about as the seven characteristics in completeness and fullness 
of the Holy Spirit that lived in and through Jesus. Now, when you look in the Old Testament, that seven comes up again with that because there was a seven-branched uh, lampstand that stood in the tabernacle. That stood in the tabernacle. And it had one in the middle, and then it had three that went off branch to the right, and three that went off branch to the left. And so the middle is the Spirit of the Lord, and the rest were the other six characteristics. So as Jesus walked this earth, he ministered as a man filled to the full and overflowing with the Spirit of God. I want you to understand this. When Jesus lived and ministered here on earth, Jesus lived and ministered as a man filled with the Spirit of God. The wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, fear of the Lord, the ones who went through, Jesus displayed in his ministry flowed not only from his own deity, because Jesus equals God. It didn't only flow from his own deity, but from his reliance on the Holy Spirit who filled him. See, in his own deity, Jesus equals God, in his own deity, Jesus had all these attribute, attributes from eternity. He had to, he's God. He had all these attributes from eternity. But when he emptied himself at incarnation, what's incarnation? When he became what? Flesh. When he became flesh. When he became flesh. When he put on flesh. Remember, remember in Hebrews it says, Jesus says to God the Father, I know that you weren't satisfied with the sacrifice of animals, the innocent animals, continually, because that only covered over sin. That only covered over sin. That only covered over sin. I know that you've made a body for me, so I need to go, so I can be once and for all the propitiation for sin. So he died for past, present, future. No covering over anymore. Done deal. At the cross. Victory over sin. Defeated death. Defeated Satan. Defeated the, defeated the principalities. Done at the cross. Done. So he had to have flesh. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin, Hebrews says. You, there's none. So he had to put on flesh, stay all God, put on flesh, that's incarnation. So at incarnation, he emptied himself at incarnation, and he allowed the Holy Spirit to fill him as a man, being an eternal example to us and a sympathizer with us, as we read in Hebrews 4. He's this perfect high priest who sympathizes with us because he's been tempted in every way. Can you tempt God? Can you tempt man? Okay. Walking through it as God, piece of cake. Walking through it as man, Total reliance on the Holy Spirit. Yet he sinned not. We really don't have an excuse, do we? We really don't. It's, it's our flesh. We just need to yield. Yield. Yield to the Holy Spirit in our life. See, Jesus displayed the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. He displayed the fruit of the Spirit to the uttermost because he was the perfect vessel. He was the absolute perfect vessel. Jesus received the Spirit, it says, without measure. Without measure. It says that in John 3.34. John 3.34. For the one, meaning Jesus, whom God has sent, speaks the words of God. For God gives the Spirit without limit. John 3, 34, for the one, meaning Jesus, whom God has sent, speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. Jesus received the Spirit without measure. Now, there seems to have been times when Jesus obviously operated beyond what a Spirit-filled man could do, because he's God. For instance, when he was at Mount of Transfiguration, when he was transfigured, Okay? I mean, think about that. 
Here he is on the mount. He's being transfigured. He's whiter than white, brighter than white. You can hardly look at the light, right? And he's standing there in all of his glory. It's like he let go of all of his glory. If he walked through the earth like that, nobody could have possibly followed him because he, it would be so bright, so, so amazingly, so other. Nobody could possibly have followed him. But when he let go of all of his glory and the Mount of Transfiguration, and there's standing Peter, right? I love that. And there's Jesus in all of his glory, in all of his, he just let go of all of his glory, and there's standing Moses and Elijah. So we have the law, we have the prophets, and we have Jesus, the fulfillment of the law and prophets, standing there. Peter is just like, oh, whoa. He couldn't even hardly look. He was just blinded by the beauty of this and by the glory. And so what did Peter say? We need to stay here. We need to stay here. We need to like build like three tents. We could like build three tents. And we could like just hang out here. And Jesus is like, Peter, it's time to move on. That would have been me. Wouldn't that have been you? Ah, oh, this is it. We've arrived. Let's just build tents and stay here forever, right? At the transfiguration, he displayed all his glory. All his glory. Or when he performed uh, many of his miracles over nature, all of his glory. All of his glory. But certainly, certainly Jesus fought his battles as a man filled with the Holy Spirit. He fought his battles filled with the Holy Spirit. Just like when he went to the cross, right? When he went to the cross. Going as all God, piece of cake. Going as all man, had to become obedient. Any other way? Father, any other way? Is there any other way, Father? If you have any other way, I'm thinking you might have another way. I'm waiting for you. I know you worked a deadline, waiting for you. Maybe there's another way. Maybe there's another way. Right? That's, 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 that's yielding. That's the man yielding to the Holy Spirit. That's the man yielding to the Holy Spirit. And at the end, what does he say? Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That's how we're supposed to walk. That's how we're supposed to walk. See, these, these seven characteristics of the Spirit of the Lord, they also describe the nature of Jesus. Okay, and so there's no difference between the nature of Jesus and the nature of the Holy Spirit. If you remember when Jesus said to his disciples, you know, I, I, I need to leave, I need to ascend, I need to go back to heaven, I need to leave, okay, and then another comforter will come to you. Another comforter will come to you. He had to leave first before the Holy Spirit could be released in and through us. There's no difference between the nature of Jesus and the nature of the Holy Spirit. So when we see Jesus, we see the Father. John 14, 9 says that. When you see Jesus, you see the Father, okay? When we see the Spirit of the Lord at work, it should look like the ministry and nature of the work of Jesus. When we see the Spirit of the Lord at work, it should look like the ministry and nature of Jesus. Okay, so he left us here so we could be like these miniature Jesuses. And I'm not trying to say that at all in blasphemy. I mean that. I mean that we're supposed to, when, when people see us and see how we react or don't react and act rightly and how, you know, how, how, we, how we either are an incredible aroma to them or a stench to them, it, it, they should be attracted to you. And, 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 and what they're seeing is Jesus in you. Not your flesh, not your ugliness, but Jesus. Because the Holy Spirit, same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, lives in you, and you're yielding to him, and you're becoming more and more like Jesus and less like your putrid selves until we see him face to face. That's the sevenfold, the sevenfold spirit of Christ that Isaiah is talking about, that the Messiah will fulfill. Then in verses 3 through 5 in Isaiah, go back to Isaiah 11 now, in verses 3 through 5, 
Isaiah 11, verses 3 through, 3 through 5, it talks about the perfect character of the Messiah. So 11, 3 through 5, let's read it one more time. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. Okay, so now we see the absolute perfect, perfect character of the Messiah. And we see that his delight is in the fear of the Lord. Delight. His delight. Nothing pleased Jesus more than doing the will of the Father. Repeat. Nothing pleased Jesus more than doing the will of the Father. How about us? How about us? Nothing pleased Jesus more than doing the will of the Father. So if we're to be like Jesus, that should be said of us, right? In John 4, 34, uh, for lack of time, it says, My food, Jesus is talking to disciples here, and he says, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. What has happened in that, let me give you the context of John 4 there. What's happened is Jesus has been sitting next to the woman at the well. Remember, Jesus told her every sin that she's done, she's married five times, you know, this guy I know you're with, you're not married to, and this, this. You know, she's like, oh, right? And then meanwhile, he's still sitting there with her, and that was very odd because men didn't sit next to women. And so Jesus is still seated with the woman at the well, and meanwhile, the disciples returned from wherever they were, okay, and they were really surprised to see that Jesus was sitting next to this woman. And of course, the disciples said to him, Rabbi, we need to get something to eat, or you need to get something to eat, but I think they really meant, you know, my stomach's growling, come with us, we're hungry. My mom always said, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach, right? right? So he, the disciples were like, Rabbi, we need to go now, you need to get, you need to get food, you need to get food. And meanwhile, Jesus says to him, I love this. He's, he looks at me and says, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And I'm thinking the disciples like, really? Like, did you do a miracle? Yeah, like, where is it? I mean, like, is it like over here? I mean, I mean, I mean did you like do like the food, the fish in there? I mean, where? And meanwhile, can you see Jesus? It's like, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And he goes on, my food is is to do the will of him who sent me to finish his work. See, it doesn't matter how you start. It matters how you finish. To finish his work. To finish his work. So his delight is in the fear of the Lord. And then it says, with righteousness he shall judge, okay? So Jesus didn't rely on any outward appearance. He didn't rely on any mere words that somebody said about someone, okay? He judged with righteousness. Righteousness. He didn't cheat the poor out of justice. And if the poor and weak are given justice, you can bet everybody else is given justice. He absolutely judged with righteousness. Then he says, he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. The mere words of Jesus, just the mere words of Jesus, have the power to judge the wicked. Just the mere words. To judge the wicked. He only has to announce a judgment, and it's done. It's done deal. You know, when we come back with him, remember, he's riding on the white horse, right? And we're all going to be with him, right? And it's going to be uh, the battle and everything. So nothing is ever raised, you know. Nothing is ever raised. It says a sword comes out of Jesus' mouth, and those are just words. And the battle's complete. The battle's complete. Same thing here. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And it says that righteousness and justice are so close to him, it's like belts around his waist. He can't be anything else but righteous and just. Everything he does, everything Jesus does, does is touched by righteousness and justice. Everything. So then I want to touch on just quickly 
because it's my very, very favorite when I was a little kid, was just six through nine, because now here's the glorious reign of King Jesus uh, during the millennial kingdom, the thousand year reign, and now there's gonna be a new ecology of the reign of the Messiah. So if you look at chapter 11 of Isaiah, verse six through nine, the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. When I was a kid, I always wanted to be that little child. Like, I'll do that, I'll do that. All right. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra. Okay, I didn't want to do that. Okay, <laughs> cobra. The young child put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Woo! I can hardly wait. I can hardly wait. Okay, the wolf is going to dwell with the lamb. Okay, does that happen now? No. no. Does that happen now? No. Okay, so when the Messiah reigns, nature is going to be transformed. Nature is going to be transformed. There will no longer be predators among the animals. Okay, um, and seemingly all animals will now be herbivores, herbivores, okay? And so it says, the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Does a lion eat straw now? What does a lion eat? You, right? I mean, right? Me. I mean, he eats meat, right? He eats meat. He's, and so it, he says he's going to eat straw now. He's going to eat straw now. And I love this, these verses. Just listen. Romans 8, 19 through 22 talks about creation. The earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. You know, and when we look outside and we're like, oh, this is glorious, this is beautiful, and this is, look what God created, but it's fallen world. It's fallen world. We haven't seen anything yet. We haven't seen anything yet. I mean, it's all going to be back to where it was perfect and like Garden of Eden. Nature is waiting for their transformation. They're groaning and laboring with, with birth pangs until now. Nature's waiting for their transformation that will come when the Messiah reigns and when believers will be glorified. Is that a hallelujah? Right? How sweet is that going to be? And guess what? A little child will lead them. A little child will lead the animals, okay? Not only will the animals uh, be relating to each other differently, okay, but the way they relate to you and I as humans will be changed as well because a little child, will, it will be safe and she will be able, or he, to lead a wolf or leopard or a young lion or bear, okay? So even the dangers of predators like a cobra or vipers, that's all gone. That's all gone. Back in Genesis 9, verses 2 and 3, the Lord gave Noah and all mankind after him the permission to eat meat. It says, Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you, God says. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. Genesis 9, 2 and 3. At the same time, the Lord put the dread of man into animals so it wouldn't just be effortless pray for humans. It wouldn't be like, okay, hey, how are you? Okay, you're mine, right? Okay, no, they, they have a dread. They have a dread. They run from us, okay? Now, in the reign of the Messiah, in the millennial kingdom, the thousand years, okay, that's reversed. That's reversed, okay? For this reason, many think that the reign of the Messiah in the millennium, humans, you and I, will turn, return to being vegetarians. It seems like before Genesis 9. That isn't for sure. It's just... People, theologians, think that, okay? For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Aren't you, like, excited about that? The earth really shall be full, full of the knowledge of the Lord. Full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The knowledge of the Lord in the relational sense, not merely intellectual sense, but in relational sense, will cover the entire earth. 
will cover the entire earth. And the millennial reign of the Messiah will be glorious. It will be glorious. How sweet is that? That we have that to look forward to. Ladies, as well as I'm standing right here, guess what? That's going to happen. As true as it is that we're sitting right here and I'm standing right here, that will happen. Why do we get stuck in the muck and mire of the everyday? Look what we have to look forward to. We're not supposed to be about today. We're supposed to be about the day. We have so much to look forward to. And, you know, we can help his return, you know. How can we help his return? Spreading the word, by witnessing, by being Jesus to others, by sharing the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, because he doesn't want anybody to perish, but for all to come to know him. So we can hurry his return by us being left here to share the good news of Jesus Christ. How sweet is that? It's purposeful living. I mean, you guys, just think. Okay, we're right here right now, okay, in Bible study. And then, just think, we'll be in the millennial kingdom together going, hey, huh, here we are. Like, I'm leading the lion, huh? Right? I mean, lion and lamb are like kissing. Are you, is this the best? Right? to be like, do you guys remember this? Remember we talked about this in BSL? Remember, remember? How great is that? We have this all to look forward to. And we should desire to bring as many along as possible. We have so much to look forward to. And remember, this is prophesied 670 B.C. But for today, are we closer to the Millennial Kingdom than Isaiah was? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We are. So next week, I want you to continue in 11, and then we're going to finish up with chapter 12 of Isaiah. Uh, because that's a whole praise chapter. So I'd love for you to read that and reread it and reread it because now we've gone through Isaiah 7 to 12, which is actually one complete prophecy from Isaiah. Let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that we have so much to look forward to. Thank you that as you walked this earth, that you had to learn obedience as a man and yield to the Spirit of the Lord. That just comforts me. That just gives me hope. That, that lets me know that you are such a sympathizing high priest, that you walked through all that temptation. And that I can walk through that in victory, because you did. So thank you for not leaving us as orphans, but for giving us the Holy Spirit. Not only the Holy Spirit, but the love gift of leaving your word, God's word spoken, living and active. Not returning void, changing us. Thank you for leaving each other as the body of Christ. Where one falls down, we can pick him up and vice versa. God, thank you. Thank you for leaving circumstances for us, Lord to hone us and groom us and sharpen us, Lord Jesus. Thank you that these are all loving gifts from a good, good Father. Lord, help us to stay in your word this week. Thank you for the resolve of these women to be here on a Thursday morning as they hunger and thirst after you. And help them to hunger and thirst after you every single day. To be in the word, not just under it, but to, con con but to continue to become more and more like you. Me as well, Lord. Thank you that your word is truth. And thank you that the truth sets us free. Lord, help us to walk that way this week, every moment, knowing that you are the way, you are the truth, and you are the life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.